Welcome back to the Chicago Fire Boat Tour, Part 2, our guide, Cliff, continues leading us on this special adventure from the deck of a fire boat, sharing more fascinating stories and breathtaking views. Joining us again is our little explorer, for year old Bennett, with his boundless energy and curiosity, Bennett adds wonder and excitement as we explore Chicago's rich history and stunning architecture. We'll uncover more secrets of the city's waterways, marvel at the blend of old and modern buildings, and learn about the heroic efforts of Chicago's firefighters. Whether you're a local rediscovering your city or a visitor eager to learn more, this tour promises a unique and unforgettable experience. Bennett. You see that? It, you see that sign? It's been no crossing, no walking across. You see that? Do not enter. Did you see that? It said, "Do not enter." All right, that's the horn from the lock master giving us to go ahead to okay, let's uh, go, let's go. the Chicago River, so the adventure continues. Now, I didn't uh, let you know that uh, when we did the lock here, I was going to share with you the story of why the Chicago River flows in the opposite direction, so here we go. Now, nature had it going in the west to east into the lake, but uh, when the city grew, and of course, the American War got all the land on the lake front here, you couldn't have factories. Where did the factories go? They're on the river. Now, back in the 1800s, you didn't think too much about where you were direction. Did it clean up the sewage here? It sure did. St. Louis wasn't happy though. But they got their revenge because they sent it back to his spear. But all is, all has been forgiven, I promise you. Now guys, on our left, this is our current firefighting fleet. For the ladies who asked about, uh, is this boat smaller than the current boats? Take a look. No, it's not. Don't forget the, uh, the Bussy was the largest of her time. And uh, number 58, the Schlager we're passing right now, is the Bussy's younger sister. It was built in 1948 and is still in commission. The Christopher Wheatley right behind number two is our newest player boat and uh, she was commissioned in 2011. Now notice that they're pretty low in the water and so is the Bussy. And the boat you're on right now is the vessel that pioneered that design because uh, when she was built, as I mentioned earlier, uh, she was the world's first diesel-powered fire boat. And that allowed her to be to be built deeper in the water because the earlier boats that she replaced were steam-powered. And so they had boilers down below and they had smokestacks sticking out over the top there. And those boats had to wait if they were on their way to an emergency to go up or down the Chicago River to wait for the drawbridges to raise. That took a tremendous time. So with the new diesel technology, these boats could be built lower and uh, the Bussy, the first of her kind, was able to zoom underneath these bridges without having to wait for them to raise or lower. And uh, every fire boat since the Bussy was brought to Chicago, and she is considered a Chicago-style fire boat, has had the same design. So uh, that's one of her special, special features. Now we are coming up to our first drawbridge here. This is literally, guys, a Chicago-style drawbridge. And uh, what is that? What's a Chicago bridge? Okay, a Chicago-style bridge has two levels, two deck or two decks here, and each deck will normally have different types of traffic. So the Lakeshore Drive bridge here, there's motorized traffic only on the top, but you can see motor traffic, pedestrians, bicycles, dogs, everybody's there, you know? And uh, that is a Chicago-style bridge, double-decker with two different types of traffic. If you want the technical name for the bridge, it's called a vascular bridge. Simply Chicago style bridge. We're going to see quite a 
infield of the river here today. And by the way, Chicago has more drawbridges on it than any other city in the world. Now it's a great time to start talking about some architecture. So, I'm going to bring your attention for a moment, everybody, to the right side, starboard side of the vessel. Take a look at this big thing on the right here. This is a condo. And this is a Riverview Condo. It's a style called contextualist or contextualism. And uh, what does that mean when an architect builds a building uh, uh, in a contextualist style? Okay, that's when they design the building to complement the environment that the building's going to be in. Now, this is very, very, very subtle. But this particular building on the right, all of the windows are tinted green. It's the same color as the river. So when the sun comes up in the morning, it literally looks like the uh, river is climbing up the side of the building. It's a really cool effect, but it's very subtle. If you want something more dramatic, take a look to the left, everybody. Okay, whiplash time. Big, tall blue building over here. Yeah, look at the color of that building. Look at the wavy lines here. This is Vista St. Regis Tower built in recent years. And uh, Vista St. Regis is the third tallest building in Chicago. Again, a contextualist style building. Now, often people look at her and they say, you know, it's too bad. It's such a beautiful building. It's too bad it's not the Guinness Book of World Records. But it is. So when I tell you why, guys, I want a little heartfelt applause because we're really proud of this. It might be the third tallest building in the city, but it's the tallest building in the world, designed and built by a woman. And it's right here in Chicago. And her name is Jeannie Gang. She's a Chicago girl. And uh, her architectural offices are still going strong. She's doing well. She even built the structure right next to it that we're passing on the left with the wavy balconies. That's called Aqua Tower. So we started out here on the river with three examples of contextualist architecture, two uh, right next to each other, and one across the river from the other two. So straight ahead, we have another type of architecture. And I'm so glad they put a name on it, because I always forget what it's called. But yeah, Trump Tower, right over here. Okay, guys, Trump Tower is right here, second tallest building in the city. And uh, it was built by a Chicago firm called Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, or SOM for short. And Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, well, they, they work around the world. Um, oh, by the way, guys, feel free to wave. Please wave, because you're celebrities, you're on a historic fire boat. You wave, don't wave back, I promise. If they don't wave back, I'll wave at you. I mean, someone make it work. But Skidmore, Owings & Merrill also built what is now the tallest building in the world, and that's the Burj Khalifa on the bridge. Because, uh, you know, this Trump Tower is built in five very distinct sections. And each section is pointing in a different direction. There's a reason for that. Because each section of that building is pointing or giving a fist bump to a historic building near it. To give you an example, the bottom level that says Trump, it's pointing to its left, or your right, if you're on the boat here. And it's pointing directly to that, that lovely uh, ivory-colored building right next to it to the north with the clock on it. That's the Wrigley Building. And that's a beautiful style of uh, Art Deco. And if you, the name Wrigley rings a bell, yeah, the same Wrigley who, uh, his name's on the chewing gum. And also Wrigley Field, where the uh, Chicago Cubs play, same as the Wrigley. And uh, that first tower with the clock was built in 1921, the one that's attached to it just to its north, 1923. But uh, what gives that building its lovely ivory-like color are very delicate terracotta tiles on the outside. And actually, the Wrigley Building, is the only building downtown here that cannot be steam cleaned or car wash. All the others can, not this one, because of the delicacy of those tiles. So imagine this, everyone. Once a year, they go look at that building. That whole building has to be washed by hand with a sponge. If you know anybody in the eyewash building for the sponge trade, this could be a really bluff job. Now, we are coming up to the Michigan Avenue Bridge, and uh, Michigan, again, a Chicago style bridge here, guys. Uh, this uh, anchors the south end of our magnificent mile. That's our high-end shopping district. And it goes from here all the way up to Oak Street. And uh, if you want to put some uh, real damage on your checking account or credit cards, here's the place to shop. There's some very high-end things here, but it's a fun walk, and there are some fun shopping uh, areas there. So, again, the south end of our magnificent mile. But where the bridge meets the bank of the river on the left, that's where Chicago's first non-native settlement was, the first permanent one, right over here where the bridge house is, and that was Fort Dearborn. And uh, Fort Dearborn was built in the 1790s, and if you take a walk over there, you'll see uh, bronze markers in the street showing you where that fort once stood. We've well, got a bridge up, look at that. Okay, looks like an early scene from the Blues Brothers, if you know that movie. 
Yeah. Rob Packard, I'll be talking about that movie on the way back because some of that was filmed Tell right me. here. But if you take a look at that building also up to the left of the drawing bridge there, that one with the, it looks like there's four Greek temples on the top at about 11 o'clock. Yeah, that is the Chicago Jewelers Building. It was built in 1927. And that was the center of the jewelry industry here in Chicago. It's a style called neoclassical. Neo means new. And classical because the architects who built this structure took inspiration from ancient Roman and Greek temples. Now, uh, the jewelers who were in that building actually had a garage built about 12 stories up in that structure so they could drive right into the building with their valuables and not have to worry about being strong after the robbed on the street. Okay, that helped a lot. But what else was Chicago known for in the 20s? Prohibition, right? Big gang warfare. And that famous gangster, Al Capone. Yep, we do know that Mr. Capone had an office in the jewelers building as well. We're pretty sure he kept a, a good eye on all those valuables too. Now off to our right, everybody, I do want to point out this black building we're passing right now, just for a minute or two. Quite all black building over here. It's a style called modernism. And it was uh, a big style of, a, of an architect who emigrated from Germany right before World War II, his name was Keith Vanderbilt. Mr. Vanderbilt just really loved things of the solid building. So that's what it is, it's modernism. But the reason I bring him up is because Mr. Vanderbilt had a student named Bertrand Goldberg who had a totally different idea of architecture. And Mr. Goldberg once said, he said, you know, I've never seen these straight lines in nature. There aren't going to be these straight lines in my architecture. So guess what? Who built this? Right? Bertrand Goldberg. These two towers were built in the mid-1960s. They're known as Marina City or Marina Towers. They were literally built as a city within a city. This was a real innovation back then because besides condos, they started out as rental properties, but condos now, there are markets, movie theaters, bowling alleys, pharmacies. It's a city within a city. You don't even have to leave the building. And uh, Marina City almost single-handedly began to encourage people to move back down to the back downtown to live where they were. So uh, they stood the test of time and they are an iconic image of Chicago. Hey guys, we entered our river walk uh, just recently. We're on that right now. By the way, if I have anyone from Texas, you know that the first river walk in the U.S. was in San Antonio. It's there. We were the second one. Now, ours is a little bit bigger and wider and longer, because maybe each one has something to it to recommend it. Okay. But Chicago's River Rock Walk is number two, and uh, each area between the bridges here is called a room, because like rooms in your house, they're going to have different personalities and characters. So there's drinking, eating, shopping, what have you. But I want to bring up what's on the left right now, this very quiet area here, people sitting on the stairs or the trees, all right, up on the left here, enjoying the view on Saturday midday. But I tried to lose your imagination while you looked over there because it wasn't always so quiet. On July 24th, 1915, the worst maritime disaster in Chicago occurred right there. And that was the wreck of the SS Eastland. She was a passenger steamer who pulled up here on a quiet Sunday morning to pick up some passengers to go on a picnic excursion. She was expecting 500, she got almost 2,000. And they all loaded on, but it made the ship top-heavy and creepy. And before she even untied from the dock, a number of the passengers went to the left side of the boat, the passenger on the uh, port side over here, to land the line. And it was enough weight to turn the boat over. And 844 men, women, and children traveled from the docks and trapped inside. Which is why today the Coast Guard monitors how many visitors we have on any tour boat. Whenever we go out, we have to call this in. And we did a double count, by the way. Um, and um, we're pretty sure we have less than 2,000 right now, so I think we're all right. But uh, once again, guys, Chicago Style Bridge here. This one, though, has rail tracks on the top. And again, uh, motor traffic and uh, pedestrian traffic on the lower level. That upper level there um, is the, are the train tracks for our elevated train. It's one of our commuter trains. We lovingly call here the L. And that's a, a very inexpensive train that will take you around. But uh, its main purpose uh, is to take people down to the business district or central business district. And so you can take that train and see a lot of Chicago just from the train tracks. On our right, we have a very large building over here. Very large building. Matter of fact, when it was built, this is the Merchandise Mart. It was completed in 1930. When it was finished, it was the largest, not the tallest, mind you, but the largest building in the world. And there wouldn't be a larger building until the Pentagon was built. All right. Now, it's a style of Art Deco, another Art Deco style. And to give you an idea how, how big it is, there are four million square feet of floor space, floor space inside that structure. 4,000 windows, another great window washing opportunity. 
and seven and a half miles of hallways. So if you do go visit, and it's a center of commerce for uh, the United States, uh, I do I do suggest you find out where the restrooms are before you go in, because I'd hate for you to have to walk 30 minutes to find one. It's pretty big. In fact, to give you an idea how big it is, it had its own zip code until 2008, one building. And if anyone has ever been to France, or you know what the Palace of Versailles looks like, you could fit four of them in there. Yeah, and still has room for a coffee shop. It's amazing. So guys, we are now in an area of town called Wolf Point. This is the confluence of the Chicago River, North, South, and the Central Branches. South Branch is to our left. And by the way, because the river has now changed course going east to west, we can now, if we chose, head down the South Branch. That could take us all the way down to New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, the Chicago River is now collected to the, uh, connected to the sanitary and shipping canal that goes to the Kankakee River, then the Illinois River, and that takes you to the Mississippi, and then down to the Gulf. But we're heading north, guys, since we don't have three weeks to get there. But I'll try to make it just as much fun, I promise. And to our left, where the sky view is passing right now, that over there on the uh, on the bank area there, that was the Bussy's action station when she was in service here for almost all those 44 years. She was docked over here at the confluence of all three branches of the river to be able to make it to an emergency at a moment's notice. So this was a very strategic position for her. Along with her two sister ships, the Schlager, who you saw earlier up by the, uh, the locks, and the Medill, that is no longer with us. As a matter of fact, everybody, for the end of the, our tour, I have a uh, very exciting story to share with you about a fire that the Bussy was involved in with her two sister ships over at McCormick Place, but we're going to save that for the very end. Now, coming up on the North Branch, everybody, passing through Wolf Point right now, uh, that reddish building right over here just off the bow, it'll be on the, uh, uh, the west bank of the river. That reddish building is the oldest building on the Chicago River. Yeah, it is. The oldest building. 1898. And if you're doing any computing in your head, you're thinking, how could this be the oldest building? Chicago is much older than that. And you're, it's true, Chicago is much older. It was founded, really, in the 1790s. So where's everything else? Okay. 1871, everyone, was the year of the Great Chicago Fire. And on three horrific days, October 8th, 9th, and 10th, Chicago burned to the ground. It was almost all made of wood, so 85% of the city perished. So there was nothing left here on the river. So the first building to come back was right here. The Fulton House in 1898 starts out as a warehouse. It became a storage for the meatpacking industry for most of the 20th century. And just a few years ago, it was taken over by an architect named uh, Harry Reese, who was a Navy veteran, and he turned it into the mix of condos, businesses, and offices, which it is now. But that is the oldest building on the river in 1898. Due to the Chicago Fire, now, Mr. Reese also built the condos right north of it over here. The Graven's over here. This is called uh, uh, Riverside Cottage. And uh, Mr. Reese, I say, was a Navy veteran, so he often used Navy motifs in his work. So there'd be portholes in his building, and he said triangles, which are on the roofs there. Triangles reminded him of sailing ships. So coming out of the Kinsey Street Bridge, quickly, guys, before we pass them, I have to show you something really boring. It's exciting. I can't, it's going to be it's gonna be exciting. You see the wooden pilings here around the bridge on the right side here? Aren't they exciting? Who said yes? I'm impressed. That's wonderful. No, thank you. Because actually, they are. They are. Now, they look not so exciting, but let me tell you the story about those guys, all right? So to do that, I have to bring you back to the year 1992. And that was the year of the Great Chicago Flood. Now, underneath Chicago, we have 64 miles of uncharted tunnel. We don't even know where some of them go. We do know that some of them were built in the 1920s to run illegal alcohol during Prohibition. But the tunnels are everywhere, even under the water. And in 1992, there was a work crew pulling out those old pilings. Now, what is their job? Their job is to keep boats from running into the bridge or the bridge house. Okay, they're like bumpers in a car. But they have to be replaced now and again because they decay in the water. So the old ones are coming out, the new ones are going in, and uh, quite by accident, the crew that was putting in one set of pilings put them in three or four feet over from where the old ones were, and they punctured a tunnel underneath the river. Okay, not good, but they didn't know it. They had no idea. And nobody knew they punctured that tunnel until two months later, another work crew was down there putting fiber optic cable in the tunnel, and they saw about three or four inches of running water. So they follow it. And then they look and they see this piling from the Kinsey Street Bridge has punched through the tunnel. It's leaking. 
So they call this in the city hall, and they go, so they've got this, this, this potential disaster here at the Kinsey Street Bridge. One of those new pilings has punctured the tunnel we're in, and if that collapses, we've got a big time problem here. Everything north of the central branch of the river is gonna flood. And whoever answered the phone at City Hall said, thank you for letting us know. We'll get right on it. So where's the hysterical laughter? Because nothing happened. And six weeks later, a pleasure boat was coming up the river here, just where we had we just come from, and they noticed a 15-foot whirlpool underneath the Kinsey Street Bridge because the tunnel had collapsed. And everything north of the east central branch of the river is flooding. Basements, sub-basements, rail stations, you name it, it's going underwater. And that's when the city had to declare a national emergency. So $1 billion, and a month later, it was finally plugged up. But we hope it doesn't happen again. And I have to say, the bussy, the boat you're on right now, was here for that. Now, she was no longer an emergency vessel, but she was asked to bring dignitaries from Chicago out to take a look at the damage. So we watched while other boats put mattresses and other absorbent things into the hole trying to plug it up, which didn't work. We have to get national help. But we can. 1992, the Great Chicago Flood. Everybody, the river we're on right now, by the way, is cleaner than it's been in over 100 years. We were down to seven species of fish, you know, over four. You can boat on the river, you can kayak and jet ski. They say by night, by 2030, you'll be able to swim in it. Well, some of us are going to wait till 2035, just to be safe. But to give you an idea on how the water has changed, I have to point out the architecture on both sides of the river here. So starting on the left, the Gray Building, that is the East Bay. It's a very expensive ship. And when it was built, well, you know, it's, um, the architects didn't want anybody to look at the river because it was such a mess. That's why they put all the windows up way high. Nobody had to look at the river, right? And on the right, take a look at the condos over here. Hey, they're brand new. Some are still for sale, by the way. They run between one and two mills, so take the big one. There are artificial hills, so people can take advantage of the water, right? And the guys, we're coming up to the Kinsey Street Bridge. I have two quick stories here. One of them is, for those of you who remember this parade, 2004 was uh, an, uh, an incident known as the Dave Matthews Band incident. If you know about that, you know what happened here. If you don't, you can Google it on your phone. Go and find out. And the other thing is, guys, that if you, uh, they say that if you uh, uh, propose to yourself, Bridge with the city behind you. They can never say no. There's a bit of magic there. My only caveat to that would be buyer beware. Make sure you know what you want. Now coming up underneath this bridge over here, everybody, you know it's up. Okay, it's a train bridge, right? And it's up. It's up a lot. As a matter of fact, it's up 364 days a year, and there's a reason for that because many of the train companies in the city are a lot of the land around the river here. It's very expensive stuff. Now, the train company that owns that bridge. So uh, they have to prove to the city, even though there's no trains that go on that bridge anymore, it doesn't happen, okay? They have to prove to the city that that uh, bridge still works. So once a year, that bridge is lowered just to prove that it still, it still functions, it goes right back up, now the city can't take it away. So we'll see what happens in future years when they decide to sell. Alright guys, coming back here, we're going to be going back up the central branch in a minute. Uh, some two really interesting pieces of architecture here, because I just said that architects have to work with the train companies. A lot of rail tracks here. So take a look at the building on the right here. Oh, the right here. Right over here. This building is pinched in at the base with that arch. There's a reason for that. There's another arch on the other side. East and west, it kind of squeezes in. That's because there's two sets of rail tracks on either side of that building, and uh, the uh, the architects could not interfere with the train tracks. So they pinched it in to make room for the tracks. As a matter of fact, these uh, portholes here are diesel exhausts for the trains to go through. But my favorite one is right here, everybody, right next to the Lake Street Bridge. Yeah, this is 150 River Plaza Place. I love this building. Take a look at it. Look how high it is, right? And the base of this building is only 38 feet wide. Some people say 39 feet. I'm sure that gives people who live at the top no end of extra comfort knowing they have an extra foot, you know. But um, that building uh, is pretty solid because how did it, there's three sets of train tracks around that building. Three sides of it, there's railroad tracks. How does that thing stay up? That's because the architects designed it with its pilings, its support pilings pounded into the bedrock underneath Chicago, three times deeper than any other building. So it's pretty solid. And uh, that structure has won a number of architectural awards from, uh, from uh, uh, various uh, industries and companies around the world. And uh, you know, we love to nickname our, uh, our buildings here in Chicago, and that's one of them. Uh, that building, 150 Riverside there, that has two nicknames. So take your pick, take the one you like. Okay. 
One, it's uh, the tuning fork building. That's the tuning fork. The other, if you're in a darker mood, the guillotine. So, take your pick. You guys, as we come back underneath the central, uh, up to the central branch of the river, we just passed the south branch of uh, the Chicago River just now. And as we come past underneath the Franklin Street Bridge, I, I do want to mention a very important uh, uh, event that happened in Chicago. I mentioned it briefly a little while ago. That was the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. All right, it started on the south branch, on the west bank of the river, about half a mile down, maybe three quarters of a mile. And legend has it that uh, it started on the farm of a Mrs. Panther Leary. It was said that a cow knocked over a uh, lantern in the barn, and that was a very windy night, very dry season. A lantern caught fire uh, to the barn, the house, and the wind blew it into a frenzy. The entire west bank burned. The fire then jumped to the east bank over here, burned the south side of the city. Everyone's horror on October 9th and burned almost everything for about two and a half miles. 17,000 buildings, one were burned, 100,000 people homeless and 300 in one. And people blame this is Catherine O'Leary and her crowd. But 10 years after the plan was over, the uh, reporters who put that in the paper say that uh, they weren't sure how the fire started. No, they just uh, Coming up under these bridges, I do want to say that all of these bridges here are over 100 years old. They need constant maintenance, which is why the walkways, you can see on the south side of the, uh, the river walk here, those walkways underneath the bridges are actually floating. They're pontoons. They can be moved out of the way at a moment's notice, and it has to continue to hear what to do to repairs, which is really kind of a cool thing. We saw Barge a little bit uh, further back there. He was doing so much on one of the bridges. And as they come up, the right side of the vessel. But to our left, this reddish building. This is the Reed Murdoch building. It was built in 1913. Right now, it's the office of the Britannica. But it's the greatest plan to fame. It's two years after the That was in 1914. Reed Murdoch served as a temporary morgue and hospital for the victims of the Eastland disaster, which was right across the river. And for that reason alone, Reed Murdoch here is considered the most haunted building in Chicago. Starboard side here, right over the track of cap, you're going to see a kind of stumpy, dumpy, sand colored building here. It's got a number 55 at the top. And uh, that's a style called Brutalist. Now, it doesn't mean that it's a brutal, nasty building. Okay, uh, bru uh, bru uh, the Brutalist building is short for Brutal Bru, which is French for poured concrete. So, back in the 60s and 70s, that style of building was very popular for banks, anywhere you have securities, uh, any building where the architects wanted to remove some safe. There aren't that many left. It was called a brutal style building. Now, we like to nickname our buildings, as I said, so unofficially, a lot of people just like to call it, I'm not kidding, the Danny DeVito building. However, one of my favorite structures on the tour is just about two Take a look at that tall green skyscraper here with the gold tower. Yeah, that is a carbide and carbon building built in 1927. And um, that green, by the way, the green color of the stone, that's a special granite from one quarry in Belgium. But the gold top, yeah, your eyes aren't deceiving you. That is real gold. It's not plate, it's not paint. It's real 24 karat. It lines that building. Now don't try to take any of it because they're watching that building. They will see you. But uh, the carbide and carbon building was, when it was built during the, high, the middle of prohibition, was said to have been built to resemble a bottle of champagne since nobody could get a legal drink, which nobody was paying attention to anyway. They were drinking. But uh, right now it's the Pendry Hotel and a nice place to stay. On the right, guys, quickly, uh, right at the base of the stairs here on the right, you're going to see a black slab of granite. Looks like there's some white names on it right over here. And that is Chicago's Vietnam War Memorial. That originally was the terminus of the Riverwalk. It only went that far, and the Riverwalk was uh, extended out uh, a few years ago to the South Branch. But, uh, yeah, that's the same granite you're going to find if you visit that monument in Washington, D.C. And it has names on it of uh, women and men who uh, served in Vietnam and never came home. 
okay, also on the right, four buildings here. Look at they're all squashed together. Two stone buildings, two glass buildings, right? And they used to be four different buildings. The stone ones date to the 1920s. Both of them are Art Deco style. The glass ones to the 1960s and 70s. But uh, not too long ago, the London House Hotel took over all four buildings and squished them together. And now it's just a very large hotel. But the reason I bring it up is if you look at the very narrow stone building in the middle, that's known as the Upside Down Telescope Building. And it's the narrowest, thinnest skyscraper in Chicago. Yeah, there is, by the way, there's a nice little cafe at the top if you want to get up there. So, all right, right off our bow, guys, just to our left over there, that uh, building, the building looks like we snuck into uh, France in the middle of the night. Yeah, we stole part of Notre Dame Cathedral right over here. Yeah, that is the original Tribune Tower, and that's a style of building called Neo-Gothic. And it's a nod to the old cathedrals of Europe, flying buttresses at the top and everything. Right now it's a condo. The Tribune moved out of there a few years ago. But if you walk past it, I do hope that bridge stops where it's supposed to. Just letting you know. I'm kidding. It will. It will. Don't worry. But uh, if you walk past the, uh, the Tribune Tower right now, there are pieces of historic buildings that are actually embedded in the masonry along the sidewalk. So a piece of the Alhambra, the uh, Great Wall of China, one of the, these of pyramids, a chunk of each of those buildings is there. So if you're missing a brick or a stone from your neighborhood, see if we stole it and put it in over here. It's very possible. So guys, as we come out to this side of the bridge, all right, and this is a very cool little bit, everybody. I can tell you even people in Chicago don't know this. But right in front of the Chicago Tribune building, you see this glass structure right here? The glass building right on the bank? That is the new Apple store. But a couple of centuries ago, there was no Apple store here. What was there was the home and trading post of Chicago's very first official resident. And his name was Monsieur Jean-Baptiste Pointe de Sable. He was from Haiti. His mother was Haitian, his father was French, and he's considered Chicago's first permanent resident. And he had his trading post right over here. And you're wondering, well, if he's trading, if he's in business, by the way, he was right across from Fort Dearborn, which is right across the river here, or was across the river. You're wondering, but well, as a trader, why why would he have his business over here? I mean, why would he want to be at the mouth of the, uh, the river by the lake so he could be there with, you know, passing other traders? And that's because back then, everybody, the mouth of the Chicago River was right back here. That's why Michigan Avenue is called Michigan Avenue. Yeah, Lake Michigan literally came up all this way. So what is this on either side here? What have we got? My goodness, what is underneath these buildings now, every one of them, all right, this is the burn detritus of the Chicago fire. After the fire was finally extinguished on October 10th, well, the city didn't know what to do with all those burned buildings. So what did they do with them? They dumped them at the mouth of the river on either side here. And all of that burned destruction came out on both sides here. What is underneath these buildings is the burned destruction of the first Chicago. That's how extensive it was. So uh, when you hear Chicago being called uh, the second city, often people think that it's because we're in competition with New York, right? Well, we are, but it's not official. But um, it's, we're called the second city because the current city you see now on either side of the river here is built on the remains of the first city, the burned detritus of the first Chicago. It's the landfill here. And keep that word in mind, landfill. You're going to need to remember that in a little while. So as we're coming up the river here, everybody, I do want to point out this building on our left here, again, this tall tower. And if you look at it, you're probably getting really, really good at identifying... Uh, um, Art Deco style buildings, because it looks like an Art Deco building. This is NBC Tower, okay? Family friendly shows like Jerry Springer were done there. And it uh, looks like Art Deco, but it's not, because Art Deco was popular in the 1930s and 40s, and NBC Tower was built here in the 1980s. So, what's it called? Are you ready? It's not Echo, it's not uh, Art Deco, it's called Echo Deco. And that is a fact. So, guys, as we come underneath the Columbus Drive Bridge here, I do want to point out on the right side, I want to get into the movie industry here in Chicago, because on the right side here, as we come out under the bridge, you're going to three, see a three-level street. Okay, there are three levels to uh, what's on our right side here. And this is Wacker Drive. Now, Wacker Drive has been involved in a number of films, too, I'm going to share with you in a moment. But why, you know, it's got three levels, so why three levels? Okay, the upper 
level, the top one, that's normal everyday Wacker Drive. If you're driving your car, you're walking, you're going somewhere, you take every level, it's outside, hooray. Center area there is known as Lower Wacker Drive and is normally used by very aggressive drivers and the occasional lost tourist. So it's there. And the lowest level right along the walkway here, many people think Satan lives there because it's hell. And what is down there? That is a Chicago police impound lot for your vehicle. If your car got towed in downtown Chicago, it's in there. Good luck getting it out. You're going to have to get past the three-headed dog service. But before I talk about that, the center level there, Lower Wacker Drive, the middle one, was involved in uh, two recent motion pictures. One of them, there was a scene from uh, The Dark Knight, the Batman film was in there. If any of you ever saw the movie The Blues Brothers with uh, Dan Aykroyd and uh, John Belushi, that final chase scene, where they're chased by 60 or 70 Chicago squad cars, they go down in the lower whacker during that during that chase. They're all through here. Now this is before any CG, everybody. That was a real chase. And every one of those cars is driven by a crash stunt driver. And one thing that's just spectacular, those crackups, if you saw the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen the movie, go rent it, go watch it, go find it. Um, all those crashes and crackups are real. All of those cars were donated to the movie to be destroyed in the making of the film. So it's really rather a lot of fun. But the lowest level here, yeah, that is the impound lot for the Chicago police. So your car might be in there. Hopefully it's not. But um, we had a singer-songwriter here in Chicago. Now, he's been gone many years now. His name was Steve Goodman. And Mr. Goodman wrote all kinds of songs iconic to Chicago. And one song that was one of his most popular was called The Lincoln Park Pirates. Because one of the towing companies that would bring your car in here would be the Lincoln Towing Company. And the drivers were called Pirates. And they would tow anything from anywhere. So you wrote a song about them. And the music is upon me, guys. I have to do this. I have to sing part, just part of the chorus. I won't, I won't terrorize you with the rest of it. But just for Steve, and because you're on the boat, and you can't get away, I'm going to sing this for you guys. So a piece of Lincoln Park Pirates by Steve Goodman. Here we go. Way, hey, to them away, the Lincoln Park Pirates are we. From Wilmette to Gary, there's no one so hairy, and we always collect our fee. Arr. It's as far as I'm going. Oh, you want applaud? I think you'll encourage me. I'll do the rest of it. Well, guys, we're coming out under Lakeshore Drive Bridge again, our first Chicago style bridge that we saw on the way uh, down the river. Excuse me. And this is for that there shall be no residential buildings east of Lakeshore Drive, built on land. Nope, not happening. But the architects who uh, designed this had a bit of an ace in their pocket. So the, uh, they sent the plans into the city commission, which was instantly rejected. They sent it back and they said, Hey guys, you know you can't have a residential building inside of Lakeshore Drive on land. It says so right here in the books. But they sued the city and they took it to court because they said, Well, we're not building anything on land. This is landfill. That did it. That was the loophole they needed, and they were able to construct this here, and the city was furious, but they could do nothing about it. So, uh, shortly after the okay was given to this uh, this project, the city changed the wordage uh, in their planning zoning books, and it says now something like this. It goes, uh, there shall be no residential buildings on land, landfill, anything that looks like landfill, dreams of landfill, falls of landfill, not happening, go ahead and write about it, okay, no no uh, Again, now we have the green light here, which allows uh, pleasure boats to come in as well as as well as commercial vessels as ours. We get the yellow light, but we can go in on the green as well. And we're going to be here. It's going to be a repeat of what we did uh, going down the river. And I'll be back with you when that east gate opens. But the tour is far from done. Now we've got a few more stories to share with you. So we're going to talk about the Chicago flag, what those four stars mean, and those two blue stripes. Also, um, what Chicago means. Where, what line, where did that come from? What does Chicago mean? I want to share that with you. Um, let's see. I also want to talk about the phrase Windy City because most people think it comes from the weather here, the environment, the wind, but it doesn't. 
So I think you're going to enjoy that. We've got a few more uh, specials here we're going to throw in. We've got two World's Fairs I've got to talk about. And, uh, and a very, very um, uh, legendary fire that the Bussy was involved in in 1967. We're going to end our tour with that. But we still got some great stuff coming, guys. So sit, enjoy, carry on. If you need a beverage or some refreshment, Manny's there at the bar waiting for you. And on behalf of everyone here on the uh, boat today, uh, that's Captain Ray, that's Manny, that's uh, Ed, and myself. We do again thank you for being here. And if you have any questions, don't forget my name is Cliff. I'm right here to chat with you. So thanks again, everyone. I'm going to hand this back to Captain Ray. We're going to get docked up here for a little bit. We'll be on our way shortly. So thank you. Thank you all again.